Episode number 30 of the Sleep Whisperer podcast. I'm talking with Sonia Story on rhythmic movement for great sleep. Sonia Story developed the brain and sensory foundations training for helping children, teens and adults to overcome challenges using innate neurological movements. Her training courses are approved for professionals continuing education. She is the author of a white paper giving the relevance, rational and evidence basis for using these movements in practice. Her work has been featured in the book Almost Autism, Recovering Children from Sensory Processing Disorder and in the book Special Ed Mom Survival Guide. In this episode, we speak about rhythmic movements How can trauma be a big part of your health and your sleep? How can being free of anxiety change how controlling you are? What are rhythmic movements themselves? How can they help you move past fear and anxiety even if you are in a situation of threat? And how can you actually incorporate these practices for yourself starting today so that they help you to calm down? and sleep better and also how are these connected to detoxification these are important conversations and so important to moving past any kind of challenges that's impacting your stress response here's another five star rating and review on apple Podcasts, relevant and relatable by alexandra stockwell deepa is an amazing interviewer She facilitates beautiful conversations in an artful manner while sharing important information to enhance your sleep and your life. Welcome to the Sleep Whisperer podcast. I am your host Deepa. Join me and my many expert guests and medical professionals from the cutting edge science of functional medicine of the West and ancient wisdom of the East. Learn all about how to discover your root causes of poor sleep and understand the proper tools and techniques to end your confusion and begin getting a good night's sleep. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey with the Sleep Whisperer Podcast. Sonia, it's such a pleasure to have you on the Sleep Whisperer podcast and I must say that it was almost uh, destiny because I recorded an episode with um, a clinical psychiatrist and he had spoken about stress, stress response, stress resilience and he had used the term rhythmic movement but he had described uh, things like walking and um, Anything which is rhythmic, Mm -hmm. using the prayer beads to to anything which can use something which is rhythmic to restore uh, better resilience and reduce lower the uh, spike stress response. So it was almost destiny that we got connected almost immediately after this episode was recorded. It was as if the universe was saying, here's a sign to go deeper into Mm -hmm. that because of course, that episode, we went so, I mean, it was such a tiny section on rhythmic movement. So I was thrilled to actually have an opportunity to talk about this in so much detail. And um, it's a fascinating website. I've been going through this in the last few days before our conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I must say, I was really inspired, for one, because you you work a lot with children, children with challenges, which is Mm -hmm. really an area where maybe they don't have conscious awareness to meditate or do something for themselves. So you're actually using this as a tool for somebody who cannot do something for themselves. So 
I thought that it would be a great tool for anyone to bring into their life because there's so much of uh, support for reducing the stress response and supporting sleep. But before we go into what is rhythmic movement, and I know that you're going to take us through in a lot of detail, but just share how did you actually end up in this area of focus because it's so unique and um, what was your story about brought you sure there? right well i was so blessed to start this whole process because i read a book that really changed my life and the book is called Smart Moves, Why Learning is Not All in Your Head. And I started to use some of the things in the book and they worked really well for me and for our two children who were very young at the time. And then I had the opportunity to do some of the training for the movements that were described in this book. So I went through and I got, um, I trained all the way to become an instructor. And then that led me to more training. <laughs> and it just went on and on from there. And it's interesting that you mentioned a psychiatrist, because one of the mentors that I had is a psychiatrist, and he taught me the rhythmic movements. The And these are rhythmic movements that babies do innately. They do them um, as a course of development. And so they're for development. Um, but one of the most common things we hear from parents and also individuals of all ages is that the movements help with sleep. So uh, that thing, uh, it just has been fascinating for me. So anyway, I just was able to, um, I was in a pretty unusual and very fortunate time in my life where we had these two young children, but my husband was transitioning from one job to another. I had already studied biology in school, biology and psychology, but I hadn't done anything with my schooling because I was a mother. And then um, since he was out of work, I was able to get all this training and I just took so many courses, like hours and hours and hours of courses on um, not only innate rhythmic movements, but um, integrative movements and innate neurodevelopmental movements. And so I have been using these movements for a very long time now, and I'm never, um, I'm never, I never stop being amazed at how. Um, powerful they are and how effective they are, um, not only for sleep, but for so many other things, um, learning challenges, attention and focus challenges, things like ADHD, um, anxiety, they're super good for healing trauma as well. And interestingly, rhythm not only helps with sleep, but it helps to heal trauma. Mm -hmm. So there's so many applications for it. And um, I'm happy to be here. So thanks for inviting me. Very interesting, Sonia. And when you spoke about trauma and anxiety, that's one of the, um, I mean, we've spoken so much about anxiety here from different perspectives because anxiety is rampant. It's everywhere. Yes. And I've noticed, in fact, I personally have a lot of um, interest in trauma and adverse childhood experiences because I see repeatedly with clients that uh, unresolved trauma from childhood has these ripples of effect right through their life. So it's very sure. interesting that you spoke about that. And I'm sure given that you've been through so much of training, at some point, you also start to have aha moments and you piece together certain uh, specific um, approaches which uh, come to you from your space of intuition as well and you take this whole practice much deeper I'm sure that yes and that's actually what I ended up doing I ended up synthesizing a lot of my training yes. and, and not only was I training but I was working with so many individuals mostly children who are school age but really all through the entire age span from baby to elder 
And you learn a lot when you actually are applying this, these things. And so I was able to put together my own curriculum that I teach and it's been very successful and very um, helpful. And so that's been so rewarding for me. And uh, I just am having a really good time with it. And uh, all the time I think, how can we get more individuals to know about this? Because it's incredibly powerful. And um, I, I just thought back to so many different stories that I've heard parents and teachers and occupational therapists and physical therapists tell me about sleep. And one was a teacher who, um, actually it was an occupational therapy um, practitioner and she but she brought me into a school where she worked and one of the teachers there who I did not meet but she had been trying to get her two children to sleep they were about seven years old six or seven and they had never slept through the night two girls (laughs) they'd never properly slept through the night and within a week of doing the rhythmic movements Mm -hmm. they finally slept through the night so it's been, uh, and I hear stories like that so so often. There was another one uh, about an 80 year old um, man who hadn't had a good night's sleep in probably over a decade. And uh, he did the rhythmic movements. And again, within a few days, um, he finally had a six hour uh, chunk of time when he actually slept the whole way through without waking up. So it's definitely very powerful. And I want to talk about something else if I can, because you mentioned the psychiatrist um, and how he was talking about any kind of rhythm. So what I teach are innate rhythms, and these are the movements that babies do in the womb and early infancy. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, we're, we're designed as human beings to respond to rhythm. We're innately wired to respond to rhythm, which is why, um, you know, parents will innately kind of um, take a little baby and bounce them and rock them um, in a rhythm. Um, Babies, one of their first movements is sucking, which is rhythmic. Mm. And, you know, they're hearing their mother's rhythmic heartbeat in the womb. So we are innately wired and the brain and the body are wired to respond to rhythm. It's fascinating really, because it's actually the most efficient way to get work done also. And um, it's truly fascinating. So when you think of a newborn baby and they have to get nourishment and work done, they've got a rhythmic sucking response that's innate. And then they do all these rhythmic movements um, af- you know, in the womb and then after they're born. And they're quite powerful to develop the body and the brain and the sensory system. And they're also calming. So it's like they they have so many applications. And um, once we have that foundation in place, then we should be all set to do rhythmic movements for the rest of our life. Like walking is a rhythmic movement. Mm. And, you know, running or jogging is rhythmic. Swimming is rhythmic. Um, Every culture in the world has dance, which is almost always rhythmic. And uh, so, and our language has its own kind of cadence and rhythm and songs have rhythms. And so um, it's a very um, important quality for human beings to experience rhythm. Mm -hmm. And if you've had a trauma or if you haven't developed properly in the first place, whether the trauma was when you were young or later on in life, then your nervous system can be really out of sync. It can be out of um, alignment and the movements help you put it back into alignment and back into a place where it can be calm. So the body and the sensory system can feel safe and then you can feel safe getting to sleep. So that that's a little bit how it works. All right. In fact, I was actually very interested to know that, I mean, uh, pleasantly surprised to see that psychiatrists are now exploring so many things beyond 
just medication. Yes. So it is interesting to see that there are a lot more who are including incorporating various tools into the practice to support patient care. So Sonia, and I'm sure the world needs somebody like you because you're so passionate and I can just hear it in your voice when you speak about rhythmic movements that there's still so much unexplored for you and I'm sure there's still so much waiting to come out of you. Uh, so Sonia, oh, thanks. Was, yeah, I'm excited. Was, was there ever a time where you had challenges with sleep? Oh, yes, for sure. And I also used to have uh, low grade anxiety. Hmm. I didn't realize when I started this process, how deep and how amazing these movements would be for me. I just liked the subject matter. And I started using it. And it was working really well. Uh, and so I didn't really understand how deep and how transformative the movements are but I started being able to function so much better in my daily life and I didn't even realize how deeply buried my anxiety was because it was always there it was like this sort of baseline um, uh, low-grade anxiety and because it was always there I didn't realize it was even there until I got rid of it. <laughs> and then I was like, oh my gosh, this is what it's like to feel, you know, um, spontaneously joyful at, with, with ease without having to try. And um, I, I like to joke, but this is actually quite true. My family was so much happier that I was so much less apt to be controlling <laughs> because when you're anxious, you're going to control, you try to control and, and manipulate. And they um, very much appreciated that I was more relaxed. <laughs> that's actually deeply insightful because I think that's a great point that you made. And a lot of people don't actually look at it that way that being controlling or manipulative is actually a sign of that sub, um, probably unaccepted anxiety. You don't even know that you have that. So it's a great point that you made. So can you just, before we go into deeper aspects of this, what exactly are innate rhythmic movements? And just describe it in a little bit more detail before we come to how can it actually help stress? How can it help sleep? Sure. So let me actually broaden it a little bit. So when babies are first born, and um, I, I will show you a slide that your listeners can look up here. Um, neurodevelopmental movements, there are many of them. And some of them are rhythmic movements. They're innate rhythmic movements. We talked about one already, which is sucking but there are many movements that the baby does with the body. And, um, and then there are reflexes, there are primitive reflexes that these are movements that are not, auto, they're not voluntary movements, they're automatic movements. And let me just see if I can. So these movements are what help drive brain development and they drive the development of the body and the sensory system and their rhythmic reflex and then developmental. And so they help us go through all of our different stages of development. So they, they're required. They're, they're not, um, they're there for a really good reason. And they're required if we want a child to do all the things that we call milestones, like rolling, crawling, standing, walking, running, um, the developing the sensory processing and the brain maturity, and also the ability to speak and learn, the ability to focus is dependent on these movements, and then our future development of our emotional and social skills and our cognitive skills and our, our ability to be upright with proper posture, strength, and stamina. These are all... Um, 
the outcomes of doing these movements when we're infants. And ideally, everything is put into place in a relaxed and calm and really nurturing, loving way for the baby. And then they're set. They're able to have this foundation where they can learn and grow and develop in ways that are healthy, um, comfortable, and successful. You know, we want children, babies and children, to be able to interact with others, interact with their environment, and enjoy their development. But so often this process, especially in our modern times, sadly, but often this process gets disrupted. And then even if we were lucky enough to have this perfect development when we were young, which is again, very rare, um, if we have trauma later on, either through maybe some kind of severe illness or injury, or it could possibly be an emotional trauma, then we can get set back in our brain development. In other words, the, the part of the brain that houses these innate movements is the brain stem. Mm. And when we are stressed or anxious or we've been um, traumatized, the brain stem is active and the limbic system is active, but these are like the more primitive parts of the brain. And when those primitive parts of the brain are more active than they should be, then it comes out in our behavior. We're more irritable, we're more apt to, um, if it's really severe, we're more apt to freeze or uh, withdraw, um, or we can just be like um, very highly sensitive, hypervigilant, um, ways of behaving that aren't really adaptive like fight or flight. And so thankfully we can use these movements at any age to calm the system down because that's what they're there for in the first place to calm and develop and to allow the, the nerve networks to access the front brain and do, you know, function the way the brain and the body should be functioning. So within this whole large group of movements, there are the rhythmic movements, and those are the easiest to learn first. And they're also so effective for sleep. So we can focus mostly on the rhythmic movements. And basically, um, they're movements that babies do. And, and I know that your listeners have seen babies do these things. So everyone, you know, can see or imagine a baby sucking. Um, when a baby is rocking on their hands and knees, that's a common one. Mm. Um, when a baby's on the belly, they might swing their, their um, bottom back and forth or their hips might go side to side. Um, when they're on their back, they might kind of rhythmically turn their head side to side, um, those kinds of things. The one thing that I would love to share is, so we'll get, come back to this. So. Um, let me, uh, let me mention this rhythmic movement that all your listeners can do. And I'm just going to describe this. So if you lay on your side and you have a pillow for support for your head, you can just gently rock in a back to front motion. Like you can just rock on your side if you're, so if you're in bed and you're trying to get to sleep, like you've woken up and you can't get back to sleep. If you just rock really gently and softly with little tiny micro movements, that's often enough to get many, many people back to sleep. So I would try that. Um, and it, just think of like how people rock a baby to sleep. So you're just going to lay on your side and kind of rock yourself. Right. It's amazing. It's so simple, but it's very, very effective. Um, you can also do rhythmic movements prior to going to bed. And that can be also really effective, not only to help you fall asleep, but then to help you sleep longer. And it's so interesting because when parents start doing these with their children, the children will ask for them 
And they, they'll say to their parents, remember, you know, you need to do this before I go to bed. Yeah, <laughs> and um, interesting. I, I showed you a picture already. I sent you a picture via yes. email about a child in second grade who wrote um, mm. that he says, I do the rhythmic movement every night. And it helps me get to sleep faster. So I don't wake up in the middle of the night. It's really precious. And I have that on the slides too. And in fact, Sonia, you mentioned one more rhythmic movement of being on your knees and kind of rocking your bottom like a baby. And that's so interesting because there's several yoga poses on the knees which involve these gentle movements. And I was also very um, curious to know from you because I've heard some research talk about certain learning issues and lack of focus even in adults who as babies they missed the crawling phase and they right. simply moved from uh, uh, they just one fine day stood up and walked and sometimes you think that that's a good thing that they've uh, you know just stood up and walked they didn't go through the crawling phase but then I came across some research which spoke about how that can actually prevent some form of neurodevelopment. So when you spoke about being on the knees, I wanted to get your opinion on what did you think about that? Do you feel that uh, that might be, uh, if somebody has just skipped the crawling phase, could that impact uh, their stress response? And is there a way they can do that at any age and uh, it will it support them if they start to do something on their knees even much later as adults? Right. So these are good questions. So yes, I've seen the research and it's very valid and it's well known by occupational therapists and physical therapists that when a child skips the crawling stage, it can and does often, not for everybody, um, but I think more times than not, um, you have missed a piece of development that's actually really important. And there is research showing that crawling is very important. What we're doing with these foundational movements is we're actually doing movements that babies do well before crawling. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that set the stage for crawling and they set the stage for so many other skills like the ability to focus. So there are individuals who have never crawled and they, uh, they go on to be able to be strong learners and that's fine, but there are so many learners right. who are um, struggling and we find out that, oh, actually they never crawled. So there is a connection between the two. It, it may not be valid for everybody, but it is very um, uh, valid for many. And so we want to build the foundation. And I wouldn't necessarily have someone, though, start to crawl now. What I would have them do is go back and do the movements that support crawling itself mm. and then do the crawling because otherwise, uh, the other thing about these movements that's fascinating, because I mentioned that they develop the brain, the body, and the sensory system. So, and this has to do with the innate reflexes. And those movements in particular are very good when we're babies. But if you don't go through the life cycle of the proper life cycle for these reflexes and you, you don't develop them fully, then your body is left in a state of immaturity and um, it's a lot, it can lead to tension and it can lead to the body parts being kind of stuck together and stiff and not as coordinated as they could be. And so if you try and crawl at that point, like when you're older and you haven't had this foundation, then you can learn to crawl, but you're going to do it with a lot of compensation Mm -hmm. and a lot of extra stress in the body. And that's why I suggest, you know, going back and doing more foundational work and it really pays off. And it's very interesting because one of the things we also do in the, in the course I teach is we do some wonderful experiential things where we can um, 
think about something that causes us stress and then we can move um, in a way where we're like, for example, like you can think about something that causes you stress. You can kind of bend over at the waist and see how tight your leg muscles are. Mm. And then you can do some movement to kind of alleviate the stress around whatever that thought is. And then you can bend at the waist again and you'll notice that even though you didn't do any leg stretches or anything like that, uh, you have much more range of motion. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is so we know that our thoughts <laughs> definitely affect our muscles. And when we're stressed, our muscles can be really tight. And uh, so our brain and body have all these feedback loops. So the cool thing is, or the great thing is, is that we can um, use these movements to change what's happening in the brain and vice versa. You can change your thoughts, which change your body. You can change your body, which changes how your brain responds. So I'll give you an example. So um, like anti-anxiety um, medication is actually muscle relaxants. Mm. And so that's because they know that if the, the brain will scan the body and scan the muscles and the brain will say, oh, my legs are so tight in the back. So that means I'm stressed, right? That's how the brain will kind of assign meaning. It's always sort of keeping tabs on what the body's doing. But if we can use movement to alleviate the stress and all of a sudden the legs muscles on the back of the legs get looser, then the brain goes, okay, I'm not as stressed right now. So isn't that fascinating? That is, it's so much better to move than it is to take a medication. Oh, I know. I was just yeah. going to say that and you just resonated <laughs> with me because I was going to say, Sonia, that's such a, a, I mean, it's a much better way because uh, even if an anti-anxiety medication, and I know lots of people who take them very loosely, self-prescribed, which can be very concerning, I'm sure that it has several side effects and which you can only see much later. So I was just going to say that and you spoke the same thing. So our thoughts are definitely yes. resonating. Uh, and in fact, I was going to tell you when you spoke about people being tight and stretching, trying to reach their toes and how uh, when you change the thoughts and then it can shift the, how much you stretch and uh, it's interesting because there are so many people who are so stiff in their bodies and they've tried several external factors and nothing has worked and uh, even with health I'm always bringing people back to this that the final piece of the puzzle is always thoughts emotions stress trauma because unless those are results. So this is a great approach. And I do want us to have enough time to actually describe the practice a little bit more. But let's talk about how do you think it actually helps sleep? Okay, how these movements actually help sleep? Is that your question? Yes. yes. Right. Well, there's actually many layers to this. One is the really simple one, which is the body responds to rhythm. And these particular rhythms are very calming and soothing, the innate rhythmic movements that babies do. And we can do them at any age. So that's the simple one is the baby is just, or the body, excuse me, is wired. It's, it's, um, it's set up to respond to rhythmic movement and it's it it no it recognizes the innate rhythmic movements and it will um, not only calm the brain and the body but also develop them and so uh, that's really important to help us build a nerve network that allows us to function more from the cortex part of the brain as opposed to the brainstem part of the brain. 
So that's the other reason why they work and particularly these reflex movements. So let me show you another slide. There's a slide here, I can describe it. It's of a baby that is, um, looks like a baby's crying. And, um, but this is actually showing a movement pattern which is called the startle reflex or Moro reflex. And this is something that every healthy baby goes through the stage of having this reflex and it's um, stimulated by sensory input, like sudden sensory input that startles the child. They will fling their arms out and they'll gasp and they often release the breath with a cry and then they'll try to cling onto a caregiver mm. and to get comforted. And that's a natural and normal nervous system response and, but it, it should be something that helps the baby develop, helps the baby alert the caregiver in case of an emergency. But then at about the age of two to four months, that response should be dormant because what happens is, is this is not just a little startle. It's actually changing the body's adrenaline and mm. cortisol. And those things get released when the baby has been startled and frightened in this way. Later on, if everything goes well in development and there's um, the baby starts feeling safer and calmer because the babies have responsive caregivers, then the brain and the body and the sensory systems can mature. They let go of that response. It's actually our initial way of having a fight or flight response. Um, but the baby lets go of that as long as everything's okay in development. Mm. And then the baby just has a startle response if there's sudden sensory input, but it's not with the adrenaline and cortisol. It's just like a little bit of a jarring, like, oh, it's kind of a way to orient, like, where did that loud noise come from? And it's just a way to, for the baby to just see what's going on in the environment, but it doesn't create the full response of adrenaline. So that's where we want to be. We want to be able to accept sensory input or know where it's coming from without having this really big fight or flight response. So that makes sense? Absolutely. In yeah. fact, you're talking about how, and in fact, as a culture and an age, we are now very sympathetic, dominant. There's so much fight yeah. or flight everywhere. So you're speaking about staying in this state of perpetual stress, which is what we don't want. We want it to be able to shut off. So I'm curious to see actually how can, I mean, I know that there are lots and lots of people who are still in situations which are triggering this kind of a response. So Suppose right. somebody were to be in a situation, maybe in an uncomfortable relationship or uh, where um, they are in a workplace, which is creating this kind of a response. Do you feel that when they bring in the practice of rhythmic movement, they can actually support themselves irrespective of the perceived threat outside or the stressor outside? Yes. I mean, I've heard that from so many adults who have said, oh, my life is still as stressful, but I'm responding to yeah. it so much better. Yes. And so this particular reflex here, this startle reflex, this was actually at the base of my, my um, underlying anxiety. I didn't know I had this reflex unintegrated. We call it unintegrated, meaning it never developed the way it should have and gone dormant. So, and that happens to a lot of individuals where they still have some of this reflex left so that they're still being startled by sensory input, not in a full blown way that we describe where the arms are flinging out, but there's something left in the nervous system where um, it's really easy to be triggered or irritable or set off in a way that's um, uncomfortable. And it's actually what happens in um, post-traumatic stress disorder. The body goes right back to these very primitive reflexes. And the, the 
I mentioned this before, you know, the fascinating thing is, is we can use the reflexes to get us back on track because the brain recognizes them and it knows what to do with them and it knows how to mature and calm itself when it gets these movements. So I would say absolutely, you know, if you have deep underlying anxiety or sleep issues or a lot of muscle tension, this, these set of foundational movements can be be your absolute best friend. (laughs) Um, And I know that, that because I've done it, I've done them for so many years myself. And actually it was so interesting when I, when I first like did all of these rhythmic movements and reflexes in my own body, I was feeling so good. And then I had a really severe accident where um, I tore the ligament um, on my um, sacroiliac joint. And so I was really in a lot of pain and I had to go back and redo all these movements. (laughs) And, um, but it was, it ended up being a blessing because then I got to learn how important these are um, for rehabilitation also. So we now have occupational therapists and physical therapists using these for rehabilitation. And um, they're amazing for that as well. So I know that's a little bit of a side thing. There's just so many applications for these I movements, know. but getting back to sleep, if you, if you have a fight or flight response that has been constantly on your entire life, then this is a very powerful way to be able to tap into the brain and correct that um, and get the brain to mature out of that fight or flight and into a more adaptive, calmer response. So hopefully that makes sense. Yes, wonderful, Sonia. That makes so much sense. So now I do want us to talk a little in detail about how can somebody actually start to integrate these movements? And is there a simple thing that they can begin with, which you could describe right now? Because uh, and it's, I do want to um, stress the point that we both spoke about just before this that you might not be, if you're listening to this today, and you, you're not able to change your situation or the stressors around you. You can still bring in so many tools to actually support you on this whole um, in life where you don't have to actually stay in that state of panic, anxiety, fight or flight. So I think uh, Sonia, if you could now just describe a little bit, I would love to start doing this today and I am going to definitely get my son started as well. So just talk us through how to actually begin this practice. Sure. Well, it well, so begin with the innate rhythmic movements and probably the simplest one to start with is the one where you're lying on your side that I mentioned, and you have a pillow under your head. And you can do this with a partner. So for example, you could do it for your son. Um, Your son, you know, could help you as long as he has a smooth rhythm. If somebody has not developed a smooth rhythm, or if they've had so much trauma that they cannot make a smooth rhythmic movement, then you want to help them to, or have, like, if I'm somebody that I cannot make a rhythmic movement, I have to get somebody to help me to do it. Somebody who does have a rhythm. So ideally you want a smooth flowing rhythm that's symmetric, coordinated, um, easy to sustain the beat, and it should be really relaxing. So if you are doing this with a partner, you want to make sure that you're telling that partner what you like and what's most relaxing for you. So um, the simplest way to start that almost everybody loves is just lying on your side and rocking in a front to back motion. So um, in the direction where like your belly is going to go toward the floor and then your back is going to go toward the floor while you're laying on your side. But usually it's just a tiny movement. It's not a big range of motion. 
right. it's just a real gentle side to side. Um, you can do that for your on your own. You can, if you have somebody that you love and trust who's there that can do it for you, it's even more relaxing than if you do it yourself. It feels wonderful. And then, um, and then, yeah, so it's just a little bit of a pivot on the side. And that's the simplest place to start. And um, if there, you're in a situation. Uh, so, no, so Sonia, is there a, a specific time that you suggest for this? So that's really interesting. So the, the best way to determine that, is, the amount of time is just what feels the best to you. And it's really interesting, even little children know, okay, I've had enough, that's good. <laughs> and they'll tell you, or they'll squirm away and they'll be like, that's all I want. And, um, oh, also it's important. So some children are really, really highly sensitive because they have many unintegrated reflexes or, and they haven't had these rhythmic movements from infancy. So if you're working with someone who's very sensitive, if they have really poor balance or a poor vestibular system development, or if they're really sensitive to tactile input or touch, then you can start by just rocking them very gently with tiny movements at night while they're sleeping, or you could gently rock the mattress. So wow. if you're a parent doing that, be sure that you're doing, be sure that you yourself have rhythm and that you've done some rhythmic movements to calm yourself before you touch your child, um, because we know that stress can transfer. So calm yourself and put yourself in a really loving place. And then from there, you can do the rhythmic movements with your child, either um, gently touching them or, um, you know, rocking the mattress or the bed while they sleep. So, and, um, so most individuals will want to do maybe about 30 seconds to a minute to begin. Some people oh. love it and they just want to keep going and going and going for up to like two to five minutes. Um, I saw an infant who was severely developmentally delayed and my mentor, Dr. Blomberg, he uh, started working with her and she wanted a full 30 minutes. Uh, she was so happy. You could tell she was just started smiling and cooing. And there's a whole story about that um, on my website. It was amazing because she started um, doing things that she hadn't done in a whole year. Wow. Just in that, yeah, just in that 30 minutes. It was amazing. And, um, and she had severe developmental delay. So for her, it was very, very, like her body was starving for it. And you could tell she was just so happy to have it. Um, and that lasted 30 minutes. And I watched the whole thing. Some people can only do three seconds. So we have to really honor where someone is. Because oh. somebody might get, if they're really sensitive and have an underdeveloped vestibular system, they might get dizzy. So oh. in that case, you want to do, you want to do really gentle, maybe a little slower and just a tiny movement to start. But most everybody can, can do this first one on the side. Um, in the Brain and Sensory Foundations course that I teach, we go through many rhythmic movements and many reflexes and um, it's more involved for sure, but it's worth learning to really develop the foundation for being able to function well free of anxiety, free of tightness in the body, and um, with more ability to learn and focus. And to help you sleep, of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because the more you can settle your body and mature your brain and body, the easier access you're going to have to sleep. And uh, when you spoke about how somebody might be very sensitive and they may want only a few seconds, I was actually going to ask you if the reverse was true, that it, as adults, if somebody were very restless and highly stressed in that space of fight or flight, um, they might actually resist doing such a practice for a longer time, but it might actually be what 
we require to shift them away from that fight or flight. So would you suggest uh, that an adult try to stay with the practice for longer and move past that pace of restlessness? Or would you suggest actually um, going slowly, baby steps and increasing that time? That's a great question. It, it's so dependent on what feels comfortable for the individual. I, I like to say there's no need to rush. Um, you can see these movements are incredibly powerful. And so they will develop the brain and the body. They, they just will. That's, that's what they're um, innately designed to do. So your brain and body will change if you do these on a regular basis. And that's a good thing. But while that's happening, especially if you've had trauma, it starts to come up, it comes up and gets healed. But if it's really uncomfortable, then definitely get some support. Um, and I would say, you know, you want to do the whole program, not just a couple movements, but it's also good that you can pace yourself and not push yourself because depending on what your background has been and what your environment is. And also um, you, if you have a lot of toxicity, I know you work a lot with nutrition and nutrition is so supportive. Yeah. Um, it's so important to do nutritional help, you know, diet and detox because when you start doing these movements, you start to move your lymph and mm. your, your lymph system is your, you know, your detox system. And I had a situation where I was in a course, it was a three day course and I was getting my training and there was a woman in the course who was probably about 70 years old. And in the morning of the second day of the course, she said, I feel terrible. She said, I hurt I'm sore everywhere. I couldn't sleep last night. And we, the day before we had done a lot of movements, we'd done a whole day of movements. And, and uh, so a lot of things were coming up for her. And then it was so interesting. Um, so we did a whole day again of movements. And the third day she came back and she said, I feel great. I slept like a baby. I, uh, she said, I feel 10 years younger. All the aches and pains are gone. And I mean, usually people don't go through those stages so quickly, but that shows you just like how um, powerful the movements are, because I think what happened is, is because she had the full day of movement um, at the beginning. Um, I think it was, she was going through a detox Right. Um, like she moved a lot of lint. She was going through a detox. Um, the instructor had told her, drink a lot of water and just pace yourself. And then the next day she got an incredibly good night um, sleep the day before, the night before. She said she felt great the next day. So it's very interesting. That's a very, and that just, that just tells me what a um, uh, deep practitioner you are because it's so important to respect these things that the body is giving you feedback. In fact, I yeah. always notice this in many clients where they start and you spoke about the lymph and how it triggers and it can detox can actually trigger as old emotional things surfacing. Yes. Suddenly you can't understand why do you feel frustrated? Why do you feel sad? Why do you feel anxious? Uh, but then you do move past it. And I think that's what we need to stay that you can actually move past it. But I think I like your approach about listening to yourself and staying with the pace and just going at the pace where your body and your mind are telling you to go. So I think I would, yes. uh, I would prefer that approach. I think that's a safer approach for a lot of people who may not quite understand what is happening to them. If uh, in the case of who you spoke about in your program, uh, there were all of you and obviously that's a space where you understand that lymph is clearing and that's why you're feeling yes. this way. But a lot of people may not understand what's happening. So I think your approach is very 
um, safe and protective to everybody. And I think I really respect that, Sonia. So anything more to add before we, I know we've uh, I've taken a lot of your time, but if there's something that you missed out that you'd like to add, um, I'd love yeah, to. Yeah, just, just a couple things. One yeah. is that it's especially important to honor the pace of children or somebody who might not be able to speak up for themselves or um, so you want to make sure that you're really paying attention and if they say stop you want to stop and if they are not interested you know if they've had enough then that's okay even if it's just a few seconds because we work with a lot of children with autism mm -hmm. and they tend to be highly sensitive and highly anxious and so I know there are a lot of children there. Also, some children can't tell you that they're uncomfortable or they may, if they're really severely underdeveloped, they might start to get a little dizzy with the movement. Probably, it's very unlikely with the movement that I gave you because I just gave you one of the really simple ones to start. Um, but it is important to, you know, get more training if you have some of these deeper issues and then Lastly, I just want to bring up um, Dr. Bruce Perry because he talks about how important rhythm is for healing trauma. Mm. And he also talks about how it's really important when there's been trauma that we work in a neurosequential way. And what he means by that is start with the things that are going to help heal and regulate the brain stem first. And so we have a really excellent program here for healing trauma. And, um, and of course that will deeply help us sleep. And just, we know how so important sleep is. And um, I think it's wonderful that you're doing a podcast on it because it's probably the most important of all of our body functions. It's so yeah. critically important. Yeah, so thank you. I really appreciate being able to share this and I'm hoping that your listeners will check it out and um, learn more about it. Uh, so Sonia, where can people go if they want to find you and we have a look at the work that you're doing? What's the best piece that you think that they should go to? So the website has a lot of information and to get there, it's moveplaythrive.com. And there's um, resources there and uh, that's a good way to check out um, the courses also. So you can take an online course and that course is called the Brain and Sensory Foundations course. And uh, I, I hope that uh, your listeners will also look at the case studies because they're amazing. And we have a whole list of case studies uh, showing how these movements have helped with sleep and so many other things. And I'm just, I must add that I was, I love the name Move, Play, Thrive. And then of course the name of my practice is Fight to Thrive. So I just suddenly struck me that it's just so similar, uh, which yes. is great how the whole universe directs us together. But Sonia, Sonia, before I let you go, I want you to complete our Sleep Whisperer Mantra. So we have all our guests complete the sentence which begins with, if sleep is the new medicine then, so how would you complete that for us? Oh, how fun. Um, if sleep <laughs> is the new medicine, then may you sleep soundly and beautifully and wake refreshed. Thanks, Sonia. It was a pleasure having you today. And uh, I definitely want to have you back a little later. Maybe we can go into something else a while later. But it was great having you today. And you made such important distinctions where it just showed me how passionate and how dedicated you are to this field because you're able to pick out these little aspects of how somebody should differentiate something which is so important so it was really great having you today and um, 
Thanks for all the pearls that you shared. Well, thank you so much, Deepa. I really feel like these movements are a gift from God. And uh, I, I do feel so blessed to be able to share them. And I really appreciate you having me on your show. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show. Just a reminder that this podcast is for information purposes only. This is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or otherwise qualified health professional. This information is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you are looking for personal help on your health journey, do seek out a medical practitioner. Please do make your own healthcare decisions based upon your research and in partnership with your doctor or otherwise qualified healthcare professional. It is in no way intended as medical advice as a substitute for medical counseling or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition. Be sure to always work directly with a qualified health practitioner before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle that may feel out of your realm of comfort or understanding. If you are looking for an allied functional medicine practitioner, do seek out more information on www.phytothrive.com or www.sleepwhisperer.pro. It is important that you have someone who is qualified and understands your health personally in order to provide adequate care, especially when it comes to chronic health conditions. Conditions.